So Ninjago Crystallized has wrapped up, with Netflix finally deciding to let part 2 out of its prism and onto our screens. And god I wish they just kept it locked away. For starters, if you haven't already watched the entirety of Crystallized, go ahead and do that now as, well, this is a review of the season. So of course, there'll be every kind of spoiler in this video. Like how the second part kinda sucked. Damn, we're not even 3 progress into this video and I've already hated on the second part twice. You can only go downhill from here. Which is exactly what I said after beginning part 2. Okay, I promise to keep the part 2 slender to a minimum from now on. Only for my sake though, just thinking about it makes me want the ninja go commit not being alive. The way this review will work is that I'll review all of part 1 and I give each episode a rating, along with an overall score for part 1 before moving on to the dreaded part 2 and doing the same. After this, I'll evaluate the season as a whole. But before we start that, I'm going to quickly beg you to subscribe to the channel, as my brain will no doubt suffer immense damage from watching this season numerous times. Oh god, my brain is already becoming mush, I didn't even spell immense correctly. Now with the shameless promotion done and out of the way, let us begin our look at Ninjago Crystallize to determine if this season is either overrated or overhated. Farewell to Sea is the first episode of the season, and honestly I think it may be a 10 out of 10 episode. The episode opens at Misdemeanor at the docks collecting a shipment of Vengestone from Metalonian, which I love the inclusion of. It just helps the world of Ninjago feel a lot larger and diverse. The new ninja are then introduced, and I really like how they introduce them, with the new ninja mostly being hidden in shadows, until their group shot, making the audience think we are getting the original ninja. The new ninja are definitely a highlight of this season, and especially this opening scene. I love how they seem to take themselves so seriously, saying boo like catchphrases like this one for example. Remember, ninja always keep trying. Even how the orange one said that misdemeanor got away was somewhat funny to me. Darn, she escaped. Also, I just really love their suit designs, having a military like look to them but still keeping the ninja motif with the colors. After the new ninja used a handy dandy green screen effect to disappear, we transition to an unkept monastery which is a clever way to reflect on how the ninja team are also in ruins, just like the monastery. Cole, Zane and Pixel are working underneath the monastery when you're introduced to the new mayor of the city, Mayor Trustable, who, just like every other character in some kind of political power, is portrayed as an antagonist. Seriously, every time there's a character of royalty or political power, they turn out to be the villain. Serpentine, King, Pythor, Prince, Otacon, Princess, Hirumi, followed by Emperor, Garmadon, Queen, Asphira, the Ice Emperor, King, Frangelis, and Prince Kalmar. Are they trying to tell us something? Okay, back to the actual episode, where you find out Zane has turned off his emotions, which actually links up to a scene from season 11, where Zane's greatest fear is losing his humanity and becoming nothing more than a machine. This is a really great callback to Wild Brain's first season and won't be the last. Cole then makes his way to Wu, who is frustrated about Quanish's scrolls being nonsense, which I'm sure won't play an important role later on. This scene leads Wu to order Cole to get the team back together. Zane and Cole then make their way to Kai who is now an owner of his own dojo, which fits in perfectly with how we've seen Kai deal with grief before. Just like in Season 4 when he became the Red Shogun, he chooses to distract himself in fighting. The part where he talks about Kalmar is honestly kinda heartbreaking. Neo is the only person in Kai's life for so long and now she's gone, leaving him behind. Cole and Zane convince Kai to rejoin them to go get Lloyd who is now merely a window cleaner. Not that there's anything wrong with that of course. Cole attempts to use Ninja Never Quit to get Lloyd to join them when instead he snaps back at the three of them, saying how he is done with it all and essentially blaming himself for Nia's sacrifice by saying how he can't be responsible for anybody else ever again. This moment really reminds me of the scene from Into the Spider-Verse, where Peter B. Parker does the exact same thing, snapping at Miles for trying to say with great power comes great responsibility. Seeing these two once bright and hopeful characters denounce their own inspirations is an incredibly sad thing to see. With Lloyd seemingly done with being a ninja, Zane, Cole and Kai go to get Jay who is hiding himself away in Dr. Julian's lighthouse, which is of course a fantastic callback to Skybound. With they both being surrounded by water, and it being the same place they confess her love to him in the season 6 episode The Last Resort. After an emotional outburst from Jay, he refuses to join the other ninja, but after all the tributes Nia washed up at the lighthouse, he finally realises that Nia hasn't been forgotten, and with Lloyd suddenly joining them, the episode ends with a wonderful moment of the ninja team finally coming back together. Like I said at the start, this episode has got to be a 10 out of 10 for me. I really can't think of any negatives, everything is pretty much perfect. So it's everything accounted for, Farewell to see will be given a perfect score of 10 out of 10. Episode 2 The Call of Home is next and is focused entirely on Nia and her water form, as she slowly begins to remember who she was before merging with the sea. The episode begins with Nia in her dragon form, saving someone from drowning and is a great scene showing that no matter what form Nia takes, she'll always help those in need. After this, she swims around the ocean and meets Niad, who tries to help Nia discover who she really is. 
This leads Nia to swim to the top of the water, to see all of the tributes the people in Ninjago have dedicated to her. Nia reads Jay's name and it all begins to come back to her, in an emotional flashback sequence which features two wonderful callbacks to Skybound. Nia quickly makes her way to the lighthouse, only to find that Jay is no longer there. She returns to the sea of their memory now found and talks to Nia about wanting to return home to the other ninja. Instead of trying to help Nia find a way home, Nia then said talks about how beautiful the sea is, being sort of a warning for Nia, that if she remains merged with the sea, she'll end up as nothing but a watery figure with no true identity. Nia then comes to the realisation that her true fear isn't being an ordinary person, but is instead losing her friends and family back in Ninjago, deciding that in order to join them again, she must lose her powers. This episode is going to be another 10 out of 10 for me. It's a very emotional episode that takes a deep dive, uh -huh, water pun, into Nia's character that Kelly Metzger does a flawless job portraying. Next up we have episode 3, The Shape of Nia, and it's a really solid episode, setting us a scene of the ninja trying to figure out how all the adventure is being transported, which leads to some tension developed between Jay and Kai that was teased back in episode 1. Jay soon comes to the idea that the Venge Stone is being transported in the shutdown subway line, which I can't help but feel as a reference to the season 2 episode Darkness Shall Rise, when Jay took up the job as a pizza delivery boy, which ended up being tied down to a set of subway tracks with a serpentine. I mean he literally looks at a pizza box to get the idea. Jay turns out to be correct, as once the ninja reached the end of the track, they find a crate full of Venge Stone, along with somebody who looks just like Bob the intern from Prime Empire, which I'm fairly certain is just wild brain reusing assets for this one-off character. Shortly after this, Misdemeanor makes an appearance, and after a quick erectile dysfunction joke, oh, could happen to anybody. a fight scene begins and I don't care how many times they say out of shape they are, I will never accept that a bunch of thugs at baseball bats can overpower the ninja. It just makes no sense to me. The new ninja soon arrive and quickly defeat Misdemeanor and thugs, handing her over to the police commissioner before leaving the ninja behind to reflect on how the new ninja are beginning to replace them, with a small outburst from Lloyd. The tension between Kai and Jay from the beginning of the episode finally breaks, and Kai and Jay engage in a short one-on-one -on -one battle, which is broken up by Nia suddenly appearing in the spilt water that started the conflict. Nia tells Jay she needs to drain her powers in order to return, giving Lloyd the idea of seeking out a sphere who had previously stolen Kai's powers in Season 11. Lloyd then asks the other ninja to want to go get a sphere, and I love how not a single one of them shows a moment of hesitation, not even letting Lloyd finish as their hands shoot right up, knowing that Nia would do the exact same for any of them. I'll be giving this episode a score of 9 out of 10. A mere problem is the fourth episode of the season, and is yet another solid episode with only a few flaws here and there. The episode begins with the ninja trying to convince the mayor to release a sphere and he of course says no, adding in a bit of sarcasm that leads to the first problem of the episode. It like you protected it from that video game thing, and the giant sea serpent, and those creepy black clouds. Yes, exactly. Wow, you are really good at picking up on sarcasm. Thanks Kai. This just doesn't fit with Jay's character. Out of all the ninja, he should know what sarcasm is, you know, being the funny one and all that. He's clearly trying to understand sarcasm in previous episodes, so I'm not sure why they have to use Jay for this joke. The scene also highlights an overall problem with Jay in this season and prior seasons, of the writers turning him into an idiot, but that's a different topic for another video. If this one doesn't destroy the channel, that is. The ninja return to their underground base and form a plan to break his fear out, leading to Skylar making her first proper appearance in a well brain season, taking over Zane's job of keeping Nia frozen. Kai, Zane, and Lloyd then sneak into Cryptarian prison, with Zane freezing the other two ninja in order to get past the camera's heat sensors, which is a pretty clever move. It then cuts to Jay and Cole sneaking into Borg Tower, dressed as security guards and Jay's character is once again the problem. In the first three episodes of the season, Jay was pretty serious, with his voice sounding a lot deeper than it usually did, but now he's right back to having the high pitched voice and whining attitude in this episode and to me it's pretty jarring. After Jay and Cole slide down an elevator shaft, the episode returns to the other three ninja who have managed to make their way to a sphere cell. It doesn't take much to convince the sphere to leave her cell, and the ninja along with the sphere, we have to climb back up to the main prison, but the sphere's tail knocks the laser point out of Zane's hands and destroys her cell, setting off their prison alarms. The ninja and the sphere make a run for it, with Lloyd and Zane using their powers to escape the guards, which goes against the entire purpose of the mission, breaking the sphere out of prison without the guards knowing it was the ninja who did it, certainly a bit of an oversight. Once again, the episode cuts to Jane Cole who have found the vault with the sphere's staff, but upon opening the vault they find it empty. Ending the episode with Skylar in desperate need of Zane's powers in order to keep Nia alive. I'll be giving this episode a score of 8 out of 10, with the negatives mainly being minor things that just annoy me personally, such as Jay's sarcasm moment and attitude completely changing from the three episodes, and the misuse of Lloyd and Zane's powers during the prison break. Next up is the fifth episode, Public Enemy 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. This episode begins with the mayor receiving a call from their prison warden of a sphere being broken up by three mysterious black ninja. For some reason he doesn't mention them using elemental powers, which feels like a very important thing to mention that would basically give them the identity of the new new ninja, but hey, I guess that's just storytelling. 
The mayor orders Fate to rest at his new, new ninja before he returns to Skylar from the end of the previous episode, with Zane jumping in and freezing Nia just in the nick of time. After a short conversation with Wu, Asphira is brought down to the frozen Nia and asks for her staff, only to be told that Jay and Cole failed to get it. In order to find out where the staff is, Pixel calls Harry Sporg in a straight up ass in a pretty funny scene. Now with the location of the staff, we have the obligatory scene showing with the new toys kids can buy for outrageous prices, as the ninja close in on the truck holding the staff. Thankfully, Lloyd brings up the fact they can't use their powers before the ninja board the truck holding his fair staff, coming face to face with the new ninja guarding it. Behind the new ninja, we can see Kalmar's trident, which is a cool inclusion, and one of the golden shields from season 13, which seems like a weird choice, but I like the reference to Master of the Mountain, somewhat teasing Vangelis' appearance later on. The new ninja and the regular ninja of course have a fight, which is really well made, before Lloyd accidentally calls Zane by his name, revealing their identities to the new ninja before they fly away on Zane's jet. The new ninja informed the mayor of the new new ninja's identities, and the episode comes to an end with the mayor saying the title of the episode. The ninja, our public enemies number one, two, three, four, and five. Episode five is overall a fantastic episode and keeps the season's momentum going, earning it a nine out of ten score. We are now at the halfway point of part one with episode six, A Painful Promise. This episode begins with Scarlet continuing to freeze Nia as the spirit tries to slither away. As she slithers away, she comes across the golden weapons which is some nice foreshadowing for what we see happen in part 2. As Fira then challenges Wu to a set of contests in a pretty humorous scene, before he returns to Skylar who has lost her ice ability, only for Saint to once again jump in and freeze Nia in the nick of time. The ninja hands Asphira her staff and surprising nobody she turns against him. During the scene a police helicopter flies up to the monastery and the ninja uses this to negotiate with Asphira. If she saves Nia they will sneak her away from the police. Now we have my least favourite part of this episode and part 1 as a whole. As Fira uses her staff and is able to drain Nia of her powers. This episode is way too early to be bringing Nia back. This absolutely should have happened way later on in the season, but of course Ninjago must always go back on their consequences in order to revert back to the status quo. After Nia is brought back, we have a nice short moment of Jay and Kai reuniting with her, before Lloyd keeps his word and leads his spirit to an elevator that will let her escape and later on in part 2, give her and the council entry to the monastery. The new ninja then arrest the ninja and we have a really great heartfelt scene inside of the helicopter, with all the ninja happy that Nia is finally home. The final scene of the episode involves a sphere in her empty pyramid when a crystal spider suddenly drops down and hands her a new staff, along with projecting her a message from a mysterious figure, inviting her to join the Council of the Crystal King, in which she of course accepts using the only word she knows. Revenge! 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 As I said before, this episode is way too early to be bringing back Nia. It really undermines the C-Band final that made it feel like Nia would be gone for at least the majority of the next season. Minus Nia returning too early, this is another really good episode that I'll be giving a rating of 7 out of 10. Speaking of 7, the next episode is episode 7, titled Ninjago City vs Ninja. Beginning with a courtroom scene better than anything She-Hulk ever did. This episode introduces Darius as a ninja's lore, being a big reference to Saul Goodman, which if you ask me earns this episode a 10 out of 10 right from the start. Darius attempts to reason with the judge, missing off numerous times when the ninja protected the city, making sure to list a quiet one, reminding the viewer of her before she makes her return later on. The ninja are then sentenced to 5 years in Kryptarian prison, creating some imagery very reminiscent of Skyban which is always appreciated. We have a short scene of Nia blaming herself for the ninja's arrest, before it cuts to the ninja having some yard time, and I just have to point out the funny detail of this random guy running on the yard constantly staring at the ninja, like all the other inmates. Speaking of the inmates, it's a bit strange to me that Ronin, Soto, Ultraviolet and Kilo don't have to wear their prison jumpsuits like all the other inmates. Actually, Kilo makes sense, as his own shorts can't even cover his ass so jumpsuit wouldn't fit him. I guess they just did this so the audience could easily identify which characters are actual villains and not just generic background characters. Lloyd and Ronan get into an argument that helps set up Ronan's later heroic turn in part 2, with Lloyd saying he has never done something for anyone other than himself, which is actually completely not true, as Ronan helped the ninja back into possession, literally sacrificing the only thing he cared for to help them. Our prison guard tells Lloyd he has a visitor, and upon sitting at the booth, Lloyd comes face to face with the same mysterious figure that invited the spirit to the Crystal Council in their previous episode. This mysterious figure wearing a kabuki mask informs Lloyd of the Crystal King, forming his council with past villains before beginning to leave the prison, setting a really well executed chase scene with Lloyd running through the prison in hopes of catching the mysterious figure. Eventually, Lloyd is caught by the guards and the kabuki mask escapes, while Lloyd is tossed back into a cell with the other ninja. This episode comes to a close with a scene of Vangelis in the Shintaro cell being invited to join the council of the Crystal King. Episode 7 is another fantastic episode that will be getting a 9 out of 10. Cryptarian Prison Blues is Episode 8 and begins with Skylar and Darius arriving at the prison. Skylar informs the ninja of Magellus' escape, for they are brought back to their cell and it cuts to Nia packing away all of her ninja gear. Wu enters her room, 
and even a nice heartfelt moment between the two, with Wu telling Nia she is more than what her powers define her as. Nia shrugs these words off, but comes around to Wu's speech when she is shown a letter from a child she once saved to Samurai X, giving her the idea of returning to the Samurai X mantle. We then return to the ninja, trying to eat what can only be described as a crime against humanity, when Pythor makes his first appearance in the Wild Brain animation style, and he looks fantastic. The way he moves around is flawless, and of course, all the scale detailing is done perfectly. Very much a nitpick, but I find it weird that Pythor is the only villain that wears a jumpsuit. Pythor taunts the ninja, setting a short food fight, which ends with everyone being returned to the cells. It is soon nighttime, and as the prison guards swap shifts, three crystal spiders begin to crawl into the prison. These spiders eventually bust into Pythor's cell and wake him up, giving him the same invitation to get to Magellus in a sphere. Pythor eagerly accepts the invitation, and the spiders begin to drill through the cell wall. The ninja are woken up and bust out of their own cell to go stop Pythor, who is already being taken away by the spiders. As the ninja chase after him, prison guards accuse the ninja of trying to escape and chase them instead of Pythor, which is a pretty odd thing to do. Maybe if Pythor turned himself invisible, it wouldn't be such an unbelievable thought. Like, you can't seriously tell me that the guards can't see this large white snake being carried toward a giant glowing purple helicopter. At least this chase gives us some excellent cinematography, with this awesome shot of Kite jumping through the smoke of an explosion, right over a large hole, being illuminated by his own flame whilst a thunderbolt flashes in the background. The episode comes to an end with Pythor successfully flying away, and the ninja getting caught by the guards. I'll be giving this episode a score of 8 out of 10. Episode 9, Handog McBride, opens with the ninja being woken up and told it's time for work. They are brought to a prison bus, and upon boarding the vehicle, Jay meets- Holy shit, Fugidove! Fugidove greets Jay while making reference to their one-sided rivalry that began in season 11. You know, the episode of the 2D animation that everyone hated. The prison bus rolls out and drives across the desert, as Jay and Fugidove have a fun conversation. The bus comes on halt when coming across what looks to be an old man filling with a broken van. The two prison guards go out to help the old man. While this happens, Fugidove gives Jay some advice about becoming a criminal before a large samurai mech arrives and rips off the back door to the bus, revealing the pilot to be Nia. The old man suddenly drives off from the guards and over to the ninja. The ninja all jump into the van and the old man quickly speeds away from the guards, with Nia setting the bus upside down, making sure the guards won't be able to chase after them. Mayor Trustable is informed of the ninja's escape and calls up the commissioner, where she's a pretty funny comment about how he is still painting the same boat from season 8. The commissioner tells the mayor he can do nothing about the ninja escaping, which makes the mayor order in Hound Dog McBride. We return back to the ninja, and the old man who reveals himself to be Holy shit, Darius! Darius presents the ninja with their new suits, with Fugidove suddenly bursting out of the cardboard box, tagging along to help Jay with his criminal ways. A squad car soon spots the ninja and begins to speed after Darius' van, setting a short high speed chase that ends with Darius outdriving the squad car, but also blowing the engine's piston. We finally get to see the ninja wear their new suits as they begin to walk across the desert being joined by Fugitive of course. Lloyd comes up with the idea of going to Twitchy's gas station, before the episode cuts back to the two prison guards. Multiple squad cars arrive at their location, with Hound Dog McBrag being revealed, and commanding his officers to go arrest the ninja. The episode ends with the ninja deciding to split up into two groups. I really love the dynamic between Jay and Fugitive in this episode, with Fugitive constantly annoying Jay, somehow giving him a taste of his own medicine. Episode 9 will receive a perfect rating of 10 out of 10. Episode 10 is next, and is called The Benefit of Grief. This episode begins with Zane, Kai, and Darius walking across the desert. Kai spots a van driving down the road and calls it to stop. The van does so and drives towards them, Zane quickly changing to a human disguise as the driver greets the three of them. Darius asks Sally for a ride and she agrees. They see them getting to Sally's van and they start heading down the road. Kai asks Sally where she's going and Sally tells him about her moving to Ninjago City to become a singer. Sally turns up the radio to play her song Inner Steel which is a certified hood classic. Zane questions the lyrics and Sally explains her song is meant to make people feel stronger and come together. Zane then points at a photograph that causes Sally to stop driving the van and drop to her knees crying, revealing that she has run away from her parents. A police helicopter suddenly flies overhead and Sally assumes it was her dad who called him and quickly speeds away. Kai ends up telling Sally that the cops are after them, but her thoughts about herself being selfish keeps her from hearing the truth. Hound Dog McBrag eventually catches up with them, but right before he can arrest the ninja, Sally suddenly begins to drive away, reaching a cliff and falling to the river below. Floating down the stream as Hound Dog McBrog follows suit. Zane manages to stop Hound Dog from following them by freezing the water. This chase results in Sally's father's van falling apart, with Sally crying about how she wished she could turn off her emotions, just like Zane. Zane then delivers a great speech about how even unpleasant emotions like sadness should be embraced and not rejected. This convinces Sally to return to her parents, who of course greet her with open arms, not caring about the ruined van and only caring that their daughter is safe. As Zane convinced Sally to return home, Sally's display of emotion with her family convinces Zane to turn his emotions back on. Episode 10 is probably my favourite episode from part 1, and honestly it might be my favourite episode of the entire season. 
It's such a heartfelt episode filled with emotion that it really tugs on your heartstrings at every turn. It's also just super enjoyable and fun with Hardlock McBride being so over the top and constantly using these very cowboy-like quotes. Episode 10 totally deserves a 10 out of 10 score. After episode 10 comes episode 11, the fifth villain. The episode begins with Jake, Cole Lloyd and Fugitive walking through the desert while Jane Fugitive's comedic relationship is as entertaining as always. We then get a scene of Hardlock McBride figuring out that the ninja must be going to Tucci's gas station. He returns back to the ninja and Fugitive where Lloyd comes up with the idea of finding out which villain will be recruited next and intercepting their invitation, planning to infiltrate the Crystal Council. The ninja and Fugitive finally reach Tucci's gas station, and it's great to see them using Tucci again after the island. Inside of the gas station, the ninja theorizes on which villain might be next, giving us a nice reference to Crooks and the Chronics. They eventually come to the conclusion that the mechanic must be next. Houndog McBrag and his officers arrive at the gas station and the ninja hide behind the counter, with Jane Fugitive behind a set of shelves. The police question Tucci about the ninja and he accidentally gives them away. Before the ninja can be caught, Fugitive rises to the occasion and bravely sacrifices himself to let the ninja escape. Let us please take a moment to salute the true hero of the season. The ninja make their way to the mechanic's lair and are attacked by the man himself, with their battle ending and the mechanic being trapped under an arcade cabinet playing Prime Empire, irony at its finest. Lloyd disguises himself as the mechanic and a crystal spider soon appears. Thinking he is the real mechanic invites him to join the crystal council. The episode closing with Lloyd following the spider down a dark hole. Episode 11 will be getting a score of 9 out of 10. We're finally here at the end of part 1 with episode 12 The Council of the Crystal King. The episode begins with the last left off with Lloyd following a crystal spider that leads him to the same place they intercepted Misdemeanor's Vengeance Stone. Lloyd enters through a hidden door and is suddenly shot down a track at extreme speed. Meanwhile the other ninja attempt to follow him, but the mechanic manages to break himself free from his ropes and attacks the ninja in a pretty cool and fun scene ending with the mechanic jumping into the subway. The ninja follow after him and once again we seem to have a callback to the season 2 episode when Jay was captured by the serpentine and almost run over by a train. We then have another cool and fun action scene of the mechanic basically sweeping the original form ninja for latching onto a subway train and getting away. The ninja tried to call Lloyd to warn him but to no avail, unaware that a crystal spider is recording him. Lloyd arrives at his destination and walks past a room full of Vengestone warriors, very reminiscent of the way the Overlord Stone Army were presented for the first time. Upon reaching the end of the Vengestone Army, Lloyd comes face to face with the Council of the Crystal King, revealing that Mr. E, never the name of Mr. F, is a part of the Council. I can only guess that the F stands for Forgettable. Lloyd pretends to be the mechanic as he joins the rest of the Council at their table. We then get some great banter between Asphere and Pythor before the Kabuki Mask joins them. Asphere questions what the Crystal King wants, and the Kabuki Mask well, I'm just gonna let you watch it. It seems we have an imposter among us. After that funny Among Us reference, the council bickers with each other on who is the imposter among them, with Mr. F only being able to squint his eyes, which I found pretty funny. A crystal spider crawls into the center and plays a recording of the ninja, revealing that the mechanic sitting at the table is loaded in the skies. Lloyd attempts to escape, but is shot by Mr. F, something we'll be seeing a lot this season. While Lloyd begins to pass out, the Kabuki Mask figure slowly walks towards him, singing a familiar song about a spider, before revealing themselves to be Harumi. Wow, what a shocker, I did not see this coming at all. I'll be giving episode 12 a score of 8 out of 10. Overall, Crystallized Part 1 is fantastic from start to finish, with only a few problems here and there, the one definitely being Mia coming back way too early. This absolutely should have happened at the midpoint or even at the end of Part 2, and not in the 6th episode of Part 1. I really like how they slowly built up with the council being formed, showing almost all of the villains receiving an invite before finally showing them all together, which was great to see all these different villains together in one place, spanning all the way from season 1 to season 13. Another thing I love to pull part 1 is all that parallels the earlier seasons of the show, with the ninja team even being reverted back to how they used to be, with Cole taking the leadership role in the first episode of part 1, Mia becoming Samurai X again, Sang going back to being more robotic and literal, and we'll see it a lot more in part 2, but in the final episode of part 1, they shine some light on just the OG4, which is great to see and quite nostalgic of course. Part 1 isn't the most action packed I would say, and it was quite sully, but that isn't bad at all. Taking its time to fully flesh out the story, and setting up part 2 which we'll get into right now. I'll be giving Crystallized part 1 a score of 8 out of 10. Episode 13 is the first episode of Crystallized part 2, and is titled A Sinister Shadow. Instead of opening with the same intro we've seen in all the previous episodes, this episode begins with Harumi narrating our life story, which once again, gives us flashbacks including real film animation which is great to see. The narration comes to an end and we are greeted with the sight of Harumi, floating in an empty purple void, 
stuck in purgatory as a dark spirit appears and begins to speak to her. This spirit calls himself the Crystal King, and eventually persuades Rumi into being resurrected and becoming the spirit's servant. Rumi wakes up in her physical body underneath a mountain of rubble. Thanks to the purple crystal suddenly in her hand, she's able to lift herself out of the rubble and make her way to the Oni Temple, which is a really nice callback. Inside the Oni Temple, Harumi plants the crystal like a seed and a large crystal grows, revealing that the Crystal King is actually the Overlord. Wow, what a shocker, I did not see that one coming. Harumi is hesitant to serve the Overlord, but the Overlord explains that he can stop all conflict by destroying the balance and plunging the realm into total darkness. This is enough for Harumi, as she kneels before the crystal and becomes the Overlord's servant, with her first order being to build an army of the Venge Stone, which we see that she got from King Vangelis in Gentaro. Harumi and Vangelis have a short interaction, before the ninja enter the room, showing us that Harumi had been hiding from the ninja in plain sight. Lloyd is of course surprised that Harumi is the Venge Stone buyer, and this is where the writing for this episode kinda takes a nosedive. It's like going from serious and dramatic to oddly comedic. This really came out of nowhere and ruined this last scene for me quite a bit. Fast forwarding through the cringy dialogue has Lloyd explaining to Harumi how he searched through the robo for Harumi, and I actually do like this part of the scene. The episode comes to an end with Lloyd trying to escape, but being stopped by Mr. F and his handy dandy gun. Might as well call him Mr. Firearm as the gun is basically his whole character this season. Honestly, I don't really know how to feel about this episode. I really don't like them bringing back Harumi, as she kind of redeemed herself at the end of season 9 but the backstory and how it all played out is not as bad as I thought it would be. It's somewhat ironic. Harumi resurrected only the evil side of Garmadon, but then the Overlord seems to have only brought back the evil side of Harumi, or at least mostly her evil side, as she's very much conflicted for most of the season after this episode. In the end, I'll give this episode a 7 out of 10, as besides from Harumi being brought back and some of the weird dialogue in the final scene, the episode overall is really good, thus also finally getting to see the Crystal King in some form. Episode 14, The Spider's Design is next and begins with Houndog McBrag at the monastery, telling Wu that they need to impound the bounty, as it is now evidence. It then cuts to the OG4 ninja, continuing to search through the subway tunnel, when they come across a subway car, and Jay suddenly bursts into total fanboy mode, and as someone who grew up liking trains, I very much appreciate this scene. Lloyd wakes up in a dangling bench stone cell, Krimi taunting him as he struggles to escape his prison. Just like the last episode, there's some strange dialogue choices here, but overall it's nothing episode breaking. After Lloyd mentions innocent people getting hurt, Kurumi seems to have a realization and begins to regret what she's doing, but it only lasts a second as their Crystal King's influence snaps her back to taunting Lloyd about his own side. Mr. F's screen then shows video footage of the ninja in the subway, and Kurumi activates a very large amount of spider bombs, sending them to get rid of the ninja as Lloyd desperately tries to get her to stop, which she of course is not. The ninja see the spider bombs crawling towards them and run away as they all begin to explode with the ninja jumping in the subway car from before that manages to save them. Harumi then gives Lloyd the choice of either joining the Crystal King or perishing like the other ninja. Lloyd soon taps into some of his Oni rage and bursts out of his cell, sending Mr. F flying with a single kick. Lloyd and Harumi have a short one-on-one -on -one battle, with Harumi trying to get Lloyd to fully embrace his Oni side. Lloyd doesn't want to and the episode ends with him once again being shot by Mr. F's gun. This episode shall be receiving a score of 8 out of 10. Next up we have episode 15, The Fall of the Monastery. The episode begins with the OG4 ninja still stuck on the ground of the subway car. Kai tries to call for help but it doesn't work, and he is communicator of the Zane who will attempt to amplify a signal. It then cuts to the others in the monastery's hangar, when the emergency escape elevator is suddenly used, with the doors opening to reveal the Crystal Council. We get to see the great dynamic between the members of the council, with Vangelis and Asphere arguing over revenge, before Vangelis explains they are here for the golden weapons. This then leads to an absolutely phenomenal one-take action scene, that features brilliant choreography. After the one take action scene, the fight continues, with my personal favourite moment being Pythor just straight up trying to eat Mia. We then get the best scene of the episode, with Wu being a total badass by fighting three members of the council all at the same time. The three council members do get the upper hand however and knock Wu to the ground. Pixel calls in her mini Pix robots to help fend off the council which doesn't really do much to help. Wu and Esfera have a one on one battle which ends with the doors to the hangar opening and dozens of crystal spiders crawling in sending blasts everywhere. During this chaos, Esfera corners Nia and reveals to her that Harumi is back before knocking her down. Esfera sends a blast at the large computer screen and traps everyone underneath it. The council make their way to the golden weapons and each claim a weapon, with a funny moment of Pyster ranting about how useless his nunchucks are. Before the council leave, they activate the spider bombs, giving one of the minipix robots two minutes to save everyone, which they do. All except for Nia, who remains trapped under the rubble as the clock ticks to zero. Will realizes that Nia is still trapped and attempts to save her, only to be blown back as the final bombs explode, giving us a very emotional, powerful scene of Wu, Pixel, and Skylar 
kneeling in front of the burning monastery, all thinking that they have failed to save Nia. Of course, to nobody's surprise, Nia is totally fine, and bursts out of the monastery fire in a samurai axe mech, which honestly looks way cooler covered in burns and scratches. What can I say, I'm just a sucker for battle damage looks. The episode comes to a close with Nia being sent to rescue the OG4 ninja. This episode is absolutely phenomenal, and for sure deserves a perfect score of 10 out of 10. Darkness Within is the title of the 16th episode and the first scene involves the council returning from the monastery with the golden weapons. Kuromi speaks to Lloyd about how alone she felt after her parents' death, and how it is now his turn to feel the same, for the episode returns to the OG4 ninja trapped under rocks. Saint figures out that if they follow a rat, they can find a way out. They all manage to somehow fit through the hole the rat went through, and are almost home free, but the tunnel is soon closed off by a mountain of rocks, keeping the ninja trapped underground. We then have a truly terrible scene of Jay singing, which causes a large boulder on top of the ninja to come falling down, about to crush them all, but Cole manages to hold it up. As the boulder continues to come down on the ninja, the four of them all accept that this is the way they die, which of course is not true as Lego needs to make more money, so Nia comes in and saves them at the last second. Nia informs the ninja of the monastery's destruction and Hermes' return, which sounds just like Rise of Skywalker's Palpatine return. I don't know. Somehow, she's back. Somehow Palpatine returned. And they blast off to meet the others at the Samurai X cave, which is great to see after all this time. There's a nice and sweet reunion scene between all of the characters, before we return to the council, setting up a ritual. The council plays each of the golden weapons onto some purple crystals, and a sphere begins to chant a spell, with Pythor of course mocking her, which is great to see. All of the golden weapons become covered in purple crystal, as Asphira finishes her spell, with the Crystal King finally leaving the large crystal in the room, which I'm so glad they didn't wait until like the last three episodes to do. The episode ends with the Overlord repeating Lloyd's words from the final battle, as it fades to black, having a cool effect of the Overlord's purple eyes being the only thing visible. I'll be rating this episode an 8 out of 10. Episode 17, The Coming of the King, begins right where the last episode ended, with the Overlord continuing to speak to Lloyd, mentioning how the first Minjutsu Master, Garmanon, and Lloyd all failed to stop him before. He then sends lightning into the crystal, finally giving the council their new outfits which all look great together. Lloyd taunts the overlord, leading to him once again shooting the crystal with lightning but this time ripping the only temple from the ground and having it float into the sky. The overlord offers Lloyd a place in the council, and with some quirky dialogue, Lloyd declines the offer and kicks Vangelis' sight into the large crystal, causing the temple to begin falling and allowing for Lloyd to escape. Since it was his weapon that caused Lloyd to escape, Vangelis flies after Lloyd first, and I just have to point out how much I love the effect of the crystallized golden weapons. It just looks super cool. Lloyd is able to outmaneuver Vangelis, but is shortly attacked by a sphere, who is pretty easily defeated with Spenjutsu, leading to Mr. F attacking Lloyd next, who runs away from the gun wielding Nindroid, only to be surrounded by the entire council. The council all throw their weapons at Lloyd, resulting in an explosion that lets Lloyd run away. Krumi sends the rest of the council down the wrong way in hopes of being able to convince Lloyd to join her. Lloyd refuses and suddenly grabs onto Hrumi, leaping off the temple with her following after him, with the two of them landing safely in the water. The episode then cuts to the other ninja in the Sam X cave, building the core mech, as they get a signal from Lloyd's tracker. This episode ends with a parallel to the third episode of part 1, with Wu warning the ninja about worsening their fugitive status, but just like episode 3, they all agree to go save Lloyd, just like what they did with getting a sphere of staff to save Nia. Episode 17 will be getting an 8 out of 10 from me. Return to Primeval's Eye is the 18th episode of the season, and starts off with the ninja now suddenly decked out in gold as they get ready to steal back their vehicles. As he is about to enter his jet, Zane is spotted by the guards, which is no surprise, as the golden white probably makes him incredibly easy to see. Seriously, that gold is just biting him in the ass here. Before the guards can report the ninja, Wu appears and locks him in their booth, allowing for the ninja to race away in their vehicles, and for Nia and Wu to fly the bounty to Primeval's Eye. After that, it cuts to Primeval's Eye, with Hiromi and Lloyd walking through the jungle. A scene very similar to season 8, which they literally point out. Harumi tricks Lloyd into giving her sword back, and she makes her run for it. Lloyd following after her, and the two of them get stuck in quicksand. Lloyd is able to save the two of them, with the help of a few vines, which gives us this pretty saucy image, for the council suddenly flies overhead. Harumi calls out to the council, and they soon drop down, and throw in Lloyd, who manages to run away and board the bounty, with a dogfight between the council and Zane ensuing. The episode comes to a close with the Crystal Temple, meaning to float towards Ninjago City. Episode 18 gets another 8 out of 10 from me. Episode 19 is next, and has the title of Crustastrophe. It opens with the scene of Harumi and the Crystal King, atop the Oni Temple, floating above the fields of Ninjago. The Overlord ridicules Harumi for letting Lloyd escape, thinking that she still has feelings for him, using this to come up with the idea of corrupting the ninja, being able to control the elements of creation. This first scene does a really good job of making the Crystal King intimidating, with him merely levitating over to Harumi and easily silencing her. We then cut to below the large floating crystal, 
with Jay Cullen Kite gazing up at it as the army of Vengestone warriors is sent down and begins to attack the nearby civilians. As the ninja try to fight these Vengestone warriors, they find that if one of them touches someone, they will be converted into a crystal zombie, which as a huge Marvel Zombies fan myself, I find this to be a super cool and creepy idea. Gail Gossip is reporting on the scene, and we get to hear about Winnie's roommate, which I'm sure won't be important later on. The episode then leaves the action to show us Nia, Lloyd, and Wu, as Wu explains to the two of them that the Overlord can never truly be destroyed, with them being the embodiment of evil, who gain strength from any kind of conflict or negative emotion. Wu then tells Lloyd and Nia about the many newspaper clippings he'd been receiving for quite some time, all being related to some kind of conflict. Lloyd points out a delivery code on each of the clippings, and I fly to the paper delivery service, finding out that the code belongs to Vinny from NGTV. We return to the action, where Zen attempts to attack the temple, but somehow the temple is able to shut down his jet, sending him hurtling towards the ground, pulling up at the last second. I guess Rebooted gave the Overlord some mad hacker skills. Pixel then calls the ninja and requests for a sample of the purple crystal, which after a little bit of trouble, the ninja are able to get, returning us to Lloyd and Wu entering the apartment building. The episode comes to a close with the reveal that it wasn't Vinny sending the clippings, but instead Lord Garmadon. I'll give this episode a score of 8 out of 10. Next up is episode 20, Christopher, which starts off right when the last episode ended, with the plot twist that Vinny's roommate is actually Lord Garmadon. Wu and Lloyd enter the apartment, and Garmadon begins to explain how he ended up in the apartment, saying how that after Mark to the Oni, he felt conflicted on whether or not he was truly evil, wondering if he had the capacity to do good. This leads Garmadon to visit the wisest person in all of Ninjago, Vinny from NGTV, giving us a quick flashback to an amazing scene of Vinny speaking to Garmadon about what makes life worthwhile. Garmadon knocks at Vinny's door, who is of course hesitant at first, but decides to let him in, with Garmadon speaking to Vinny about how when he is resurrected from the cursed realm, they only brought back his evil side, which is just incorrect. Well, the evil part being brought back is true, but the part about the cursed realm is not, as he is actually brought back from the departed realm. Yes, the riders just wanted to get home early that day. We then get a fun montage of Garmadon trying to help people before being introduced to the best character of the season, Christopher. Lloyd berates Garmadon for raising Christopher and declares that Garmadon will never change, shouting at him to explain the newspaper clippings. Garmadon explains to Wu and Lloyd that he just wants to be left alone, with Wu mentioning how the villains outnumber them, with the mention of Rumi getting Garmadon's attention. Wu tries to convince Garmadon to join them, but Garmadon refuses saying he's unable to help others until he finds his true self, reminding me of his time as Sensei Garmadon in Season 3, when he mentions he has taken a vow of no violence. Lloyd and Wu leave Garmadon, but after a sudden explosion, they run back into the room, giving us the saddest death scene of the entire show, with Garmadon crying out in anger as Christopher and destroyed pot rests in his hands. This leads to Garmadon unveiling his only form, and he begins to absolutely obliterate the Vengestone army. The episode ends with Wu telling Lloyd that the only way they might stand a chance is if Lloyd embraces his only side. Besides the small error of Garmadon coming back from the Cursed Realm, I'd say this is a great episode that will be giving a score of 9 out of 10. A Lesson in Anger is episode 21 of the season, with the first scene opening with the original 4 ninja still fighting off the Vengestone army. Cole's vehicle is damaged but he and Jay are saved by Nia on the bounty, who tells them all to meet up at the Samurai X Cave. Inside the Sam X Cave, Wu tells the ninja that the only form is the weakness of the Vengestone army, with Garmadon walking in we have a quick recreation of a scene from episode 10, The Grey Ninja. Garmadon then begins to train Lloyd, which really just involves Garmadon yelling at Lloyd, until Wu comes to the realization that if there's an all-powerful Oni form, there must be an all-powerful dragon form as well. The episode cuts to the city, being invaded by the Vengestone army. The mayor tries to calm everyone down by sending out the new ninja to fight the army, which of course does not go well, and ends with them all being crystallized. Hey, there we go, the name of the season. Now if only I could just end this video here. Honestly, I found the scene of the new ninja being corrupted to be very chilling and eerie, especially with the way they play it up like a horror scene, and really amplify that they become zombies with their crooked movements and mumbling. After that, we return back to Garmadon training Lloyd, who finally manages to tap into his only side, lighting his hands on fire with purple flames that he quickly gets rid of. Garmadon berates Lloyd for giving up and even insults who was teaching, before Pixel walks into the scene to reveal she has managed to fix the problem with the crystals, draining the power from the ninja's vehicles, all thanks to nanotech. This is literally the laziest solution they could have done. If there's anything I've learned from anything, it's that nanotech can solve every problem. You've been shot right through the heart? Don't worry, we've got nanotech. You're dying of starvation? Don't worry, we have nanotech. Your wife fought to divorce? Don't worry. Okay, I guess nanotech can't solve every problem. The episode wraps up with the ninja getting into their vehicles and speeding off to defend the city. I'll give this episode a rating of 7 out of 10. Episode 22 is next up, and it's titled Brave But Foolish. Opening with the Crystal King's Temple floating into the city, as the ninja used the new nanotech upgrades to destroy the Vengestone army. After this, the episode cuts to all the prisoners watching the ninja, 
and this scene is really just here to set up a future episode. It then switches over to Nia, Lloyd and Gamron in the bounty, with Wu joining them, showing off the dragon armor, that Lloyd wrongfully calls the golden armor. Cersei, how do you make that mistake? Lloyd ends up storming out of the room, which leads to Gamron pulling out the remains of Christopher, with Nia asking why he carries it around. Gamron explains that the plant was the only green in his life, hoping to help it grow and thrive and forgive him, with the plant being a very obvious allegory for Lloyd. Nia tells Gamron that Christopher is a type of plant that is basically unkillable, saying how that no matter how hard you try, you can't kill it. Which, to me, feels like it's supposed to represent the unkillable love between a father and son with Lloyd and Garmanon. We are then transitioned over to Harumi and the Overlord, who are attacked by Zane's jet, before the bounty flies in and grapples onto the Crystal Island, trying to drag it away from the city. The Overlord sends out numerous Crystal Dragons to attack the bounty, with Garmanon transforming his only form to destroy them. Locking the eyes of Harumi for a moment, who flies over to the bounty and destroys one of the thrusters. Wu suddenly jumps off the bounty, revealing that Pixel had installed the wings into the dragon armor, flying into the crystal island and beginning to climb up to face the overlord. Before we can see that however, there's a short scene of Kai and Cole's vehicles crashing, and I really like how they cut the black to really emphasize how much damage the crash did. After Kai and Cole's crash, Zane's jet is torn apart with Leadstone plummeting down to the city, and scraping along the road before his jet is flung through the air. It then returns to Wu reaching the top of the crystal island, and engaging in an awesome battle against the overlord which is absolutely fantastic. Wu ends up losing the battle and is knocked off to Crystal Island, able to save himself with the newly added wings. The Overlord walks up to the crystal in the middle of the island and charges himself up, crystallizing the entire city along with shooting a blast right through the bounty. That gives us a short scene of Jake crashing like the other ninja. Not as bad as Zane who definitely got the worst treatment. Nia tells Lloyd to hit the air brakes and he managed to do so, resulting in the bounty splitting in half, with it looking like Nia's plummeting to her death, which of course the writers would never dare to do, so the sails conveniently fly out and save her. The episode ends with Lloyd and Gamron's part of the bounty crashing, and the Overlord sitting on his throne victorious. This episode will get an 8 out of 10. Quit in Time is the 23rd episode of the season, beginning with Wu soaring through the sky before he is chased down by a crystal dragon he managed to evade. Another crystal dragon soon comes along and grabs hold of his wings. To escape the dragon, Wu unclips his wings and falls into a canal, being saved by Antonia and Nelson who resuscitate him, just like in the episode Paper Girl from the previous season. Nelson and Antonia hurry away at Wu, just as the mechanic appears making his first appearance since episode 18. The mechanic and his Avengerstone warriors come across Nia trapped under the bounty's mast. The mechanic taunts Nia before almost saying the name of the season. Crystallizer, boys! Ah, oh, we are so close. This meme was almost real. Yes! Hell yeah! Hey, come on, baby! Come on! Yes! Come on! Ah! Yes! Yes! Before the Avengerstone warriors can crystallize Nia, Jay speeds on on his bike and we have a great moment of Jay actually being serious while attacking a mechanic. Jay's character never gets these kind of moments anymore, so it was really great to see this happen. Jay tries to lift the mask off of Nia, but can't. As the two of them desperately try to escape, Nia's struggling causes a nearby fire hydrant to burst open and wash away the Vengeance and Warriors, signaling that Nia's powers are slowly coming back. Jay and Nia speed away as the episode cuts to the newspaper warehouse, with Antonia and Nelson entering with Wu. Nelson tells Wu that they can begin planning a counterattack, but Wu instantly says no, not wanting to risk the lives of children. Wu blames himself for making things worse, as he tells everyone that they need to leave the city. We then return to Jay and Nia for a short scene of Jay coming up with the idea of using Nia's returning power to call in Benthamar. Wu gives everyone the orders of escaping the city, but before they can make their escape, an innocent couple is attacked outside of the warehouse, leading to Wu springing into action to save them with a broom that must be made out of metal. The newspaper delivery team joins the battle, which inspires Wu to continue the fight against the Overlord, with the episode closing out a great speech from Wu that he broadcasts over a radio. Very similar to the Hunted episode, Radio Free Ninjago, where Lloyd did the same. I'll give this episode a rating of 8 out of 10. We're turning out the Ice Emperor is episode 24, and begins with Garmanon and Lloyd's half of the bounty crashing. Garmanon offers to help Lloyd at the rubble, but Lloyd refuses to accept Garmanon's help. As Lloyd and Garmanon try to walk away from the bounty, Hound Dog McBrack suddenly pulls up and attempts to arrest Lloyd. Garmanon goes to attack Hound Dog, but Lloyd stops him, with the two of them jumping into the sewers with Hound Dog following after. Now in the sewers, Hound Dog comes across these really cool looking infected Serpentine, and is saved by Lloyd, with him telling Hound Dog that orders aren't everything before running away. The episode cuts away from the sewers and to the newspaper warehouse, with Masako entering and handing over a scroll from Quanish the Elder, explaining how that Quanish had the gift of seeing the future, and he saw a potential victory where the ninja could be given a dragon form. After this, we get to see Pixel easily beat the Vengeance and Warriors before fighting the wreckage of Zane's jet, with Zane's cloaking ability giving us some nice references along with teasing the return of Racer 7 and Benzamar. Pixel opens the cockpit to find that Zane is literally broken into pieces, with his cloaking ability stuck as the Ice Emperor. Pixel straps the Ice Emperor to her back and begins making her way to Bork Tower, but the two of them are surrounded by Vengeance warriors. Luckily for the two, our prison boss suddenly flies down the road and rescues them, 
revealing the driver to be Ronan, along with Kilo, Ultraviolet, and holy shit, Fugidove. The bus begins to make its way towards Borg Tower, and Ronan recalls what happened back in the prison, with Ronan giving a nice inspirational speech to the other prisoners to convince them to join him in helping the ninja save the city. They then arrive at Borg Tower and meet up with Cyrus Borg. The episode ends with Pixel asking Borg to repair Zane, but they worry they don't have enough time. I'll be giving this episode a score of 7 out of 10. Episode 25 is titled Safe Haven, and opens with a replay of Kai and Cole's crash before transitioning to a neat point of view from Kai as he wakes up from the crash and gets out of his vehicle. As Kai tries to get Cole out of his vehicle, Pythor finally makes an appearance again and spots the ninja's crashed vehicles, slithering over and using his sense of smell to locate Kai and Cole, which is a really nice detail. Kai jumps out from behind a dumpster and attacks Pythor, only for Pythor to easily block the attack with his nunchucks. Skylar then drops down from a rooftop and absorbs Kai and Cole's powers, using them to fight Pythor off and create a large stone wall to help the three of them escape. The three ninja use an arcade as a hiding spot and end up meeting Jake, who is great to see again. While in the arcade, Skylar's radio goes off and a new speech from quitting time is heard, giving them the message to go to the newspaper warehouse. As the ninjas sneak their way across the city, he transitions to down below, where Lloyd and Garmin have found the home of the Serpentine, with Lloyd pointing at a Ninjago recreation of the Chad vs Virgin meme, which is pretty funny to see. Garmin tells Lloyd that he must embrace his Oni side, which leads to Lloyd having an emotional outburst towards him. They're really into Garmin that his greatest fears becoming like him, saying that Garmin doesn't care about anyone or anything. In response, Garmin takes out Christopher, with Lloyd saying a plant doesn't count, ranting that a plant doesn't have feelings or doesn't care about being abandoned or not getting a birthday card, which to me is a weird inclusion, making this scene feel like a rejected dialogue from the Ninjago movie. The episode returns to the ninja up above, who are surrounded by crystal zombies, but are saved by the paper delivery service being brought to the warehouse in which you get a nice heartwarming scene of Jake being reunited with his parents, which is such a great tribute to the real Jake who unfortunately passed away in 2021. This episode will be getting a 9 out of 10. The next episode is compatible, and it's the 26th episode of the season. It starts with a hopeful monologue from Kai, which is really just for a noodle time. Guess this is Ninjago's version of pizza time. Noodle time! Wu rants about the dragon form scroll being nonsense, before Cole suddenly cheers with everyone rushing over to him. Wu throwing the scroll into the air which falls over and hints towards the solution. Cole explains that they have managed to match up the radio to the ninja's comms, with Wu radioing the other ninja who fill Wu on and where they all are. After the radio call, Wu tells Cole that it is time to call in Princess Vanya, but Cole says they'll need a stronger transmitter to reach Antaro. This is when the secret goat of the season, Vinny, steps in and suggests the NGTV's broadcast tower. The ninjas say they won't be able to reach the broadcast tower when suddenly Racer 7 appears and offers her services, revealing her new name of Blazy Hyperspeed. I'm just gonna stick here Racer 7 because I cannot be bothered to say that name. It transitions to Borg Tower where we get to see Ultraviolet, Fugitive, and Kilo get new mechs along with Borg telling Pixel that Zane's memory bank is damaged, making him like a person in a coma. Pixel brings up the fact that people wake up from comas, but since Zane is an android, Borg is unsure if that will happen, ending the scene on an uncertain note. There is then a short scene of Cole, Vinny, and Racer 7 jumping into Vinny's van before speeding off, and the episode returns to Borg Tower where it is now time to leave the unconscious Zane. Pixel tries to get Zane to wake up, but it doesn't work, leading to her giving a very heart-touching speech, about Zane giving her the ability to become more than an android and have the capacity to love. Pixel and the others go to leave the building, but in typical story writing fashion, the speech Pixel gave us all it takes to bring Zane back. I'll be giving this episode a score of 8 out of 10. Episode 27 is next, and titled Distress Calls. The episode begins at Lloyd and Garbron still in the Serpentine Library, with Garbron continuing to tell Lloyd to embrace his own side. Lloyd argues with Garmanon, saying that his human side is not weak and that having compassion for others doesn't make you weak. Garmanon doesn't understand the word compassion, with Lloyd telling him that he's incapable of feeling it. Lloyd writes a message for the server team and talks about how only aren't capable of caring and only destroying, which is just wrong as we saw back in season 9 with Mistake, but okay Lloyd, go off I guess. A noise is suddenly heard and Lloyd rushes off to see what it was, with Garmanon leaving Christopher behind. We then cut to Jay and Nia committing vehicular manslaughter before Nia jumps down and places her hands into the ocean with two stray fish swimming up there and then swimming away, making it unclear if her message to Marlopio was sent. After this, the episode transitions to a short scene of Vinny's news van racing through the city as Racer 7 narrates in a sort of an action movie before returning to Lloyd and Garmanon in the sewers. The two of them find out the cause of the noise being three infected Serpentine, ensuing that fight that has a really bad line from Lloyd. Yeah, that felt good. Garmanon runs towards the last Serpentine and Lloyd thinks he's about to destroy him, with Garmanon instead trapping the snake in a barrel explaining that if he was infected, he wouldn't want to be destroyed, showing Lloyd that he is capable of compassion. The thrilling race of the NGTV tower continues, with them encountering the problem of the bridge being vertical. Racer 7 doesn't let this stop her, and she goes full speed up the bridge, 
managing to reach the tower perfectly fine. He then returns to the sewers, with Lloyd noticing Christopher and is gone. Garmanon tells Lloyd that he got rid of it, which Lloyd asks why, with Garmanon repeating Lloyd's words of he can't learn how to care. Lloyd takes his words back, and almost admits to Garmanon that he said it all just because he was jealous of the plant. But seeing that the plant is the only thing that made his father happy, he decides to go back and get it, ending the scene and cutting to the top of the NGTV tower. Vinny starts to broadcast to Shintaro as Cole explains the situation to Vanu. During his speech, they are all attacked by crystal dragons which destroy the tower, with the three of them believing the message wasn't sent. After this, we see Kai training the paper boys like he did his own students in the first episode, which is a nice callback. Who then calls the other ninja who all say they have failed in their attempts to call for help, ending the episode on a somber note. I'll give this episode a 7 out of 10. An Issue of Trust is the 20th episode and opens on a scene showing how desolate the city is before showing all of the ninja meeting up outside the paper warehouse. They enter the warehouse and Wu shows them the prophecy of Quanish. Wu examines the image on the scroll and Kai says the iconic Weekend Whip lyrics kick back, whip around and spin, which definitely put a smile on my face. This leads to the ninja trying to perform the steps to achieve dragon form, but they are unsuccessful. The episode then cuts to the crystal island with Pythor landing on it, when they finally get to see the council all back together. The overlord berates the council for not bringing in the ninja. Kurumi and Mr. F enter the scene, with Mr. F freak playing a radio transmission, which Kurumi uses to figure out that the ninja are hiding in the newspaper warehouse. We return to the ninja practicing dragon form, which they once again fail. Wu throws the scroll to the ground, revealing that all they had to do was fold it over. How in the world did they not try that already? They fold the scroll over to reveal an image of a four-headed dragon, with a message written in the old tongue, saying that only when allies unite for a selfless act will dragon form be achieved. Borg calls the ninja and warns him about the Overlord's army coming to attack, with Garmanon coming up the idea of attacking the Overlord from behind as the ninja fight his army. Lloyd decides to join his father, with Wu forming a plan of the ninja staying back to draw the Overlord's attention. Lloyd gets Keela's mech to fly to the Crystal Island, reminding me of the final battle in Season 2 with Lloyd piloting the Golden Mech. Garmanon asks Lloyd if he trusts him, with Lloyd saying he thinks he trusts him, angering Garmanon that his own son doesn't trust him. Lloyd and Garmanon then fly towards the Overlord, right as the Overlord's army marches in front of the warehouse. There is a stalemate between the ninja and the army, which leads to Jay trying to resolve things by using his words, which is a nice reference to how he defeated both Unagami and Otakon with the use of his words. This, of course, doesn't work, and the scene ends with both sides charging on one another before it cuts to Harumi and the Overlord on the island, with the Overlord being knocked down by Garmadon. Lloyd joins shortly and the episode comes to a close with the second final battle beginning. I'll be giving this episode a score of 7 out of 10. Episode 29 is next and has the title of Dragon Form. This episode opens right where the last one left off, with the Overlord zapping Garmanon backwards. The Overlord tells Garmanon and Lloyd that it won't be so easy to defeat him, saying that his Crystal King form is merely a shell that he can change at will, leading to him creating a large crystal cocoon, similar in shape to his spirit form. The crystal cocoon bursts open, and the Overlord's centaur form drops down and it continues to battle. Destroying Lloyd's mech which almost sends Lloyd plummeting to the ground, Sam grabbing on at the last second and pulling himself up to charge at the Overlord side by side with Garmadon. He then cuts to down below with the ninja trying to fight off the Crystal Army. The Crystal Army gets too close which results in the ninja's power being neutralized. Ultraviolet, Kilo and Ronin are then infected, leading to the ninja being pushed into a corner as it seems to be the end. Before anything else can happen, the Shantara Army flies in, followed by the Keepers, the Merlopians, the Surfer Team, and a bunch of side characters in an absolutely awesome team up scene. The ninja realized that this is the moment the prophecy spoke of, the moment when every ally came together to fight for the same cause. This prompts the ninja to try dragon form once again, and this time it's successful, with the weekend with playing in the background which is great to hear. After the ninja transform, it focuses just on Jay which is a nice nod to the fact that he was the first in the ninja to learn spinjutsu before they all fly into battle. I do wish that they continued to play the weekend whip here, but that's very much a nitpick. I just think it would have made this scene a lot more exciting and really emphasize that this is the turning point in the battle, the point where the ninja finally have the upper hand and are on equal footing with the crystal army. Mr. F flies after Pixel in her mech, but before he can throw a shuriken at her, Saiyan flies in and knocks him through a better call Darius billboard, with a one on one fight ensuing. During the fight Zane catches the corrupted shuriken and starts to be infected, but by channeling his elemental power into the weapon he is able to break it from the crystal, ending the battle by crushing Mr. F under the billboard. Zayn being the first to regain his golden weapon, just has to be an order to him being the first of the ninja to unlock his true potential. The episode returns to the Overlord battle, with Lloyd and Garmanon working together, which seems to be working. The Overlord eventually pins the two of them down and begins monologuing on how it was all the Overlord's design that Garmanon was corrupted, explaining that he possessed the Great Devourer to corrupt Garmanon into a vessel for himself to control. Harumi is outraged after hearing this, and leaps into battle against the Overlord. Strange that she never did that to Pythor despite it being the one who released the Devourer, which in turn led to her parents' death, 
but I guess we'll just chalk that up to the not being public knowledge that Pythor was the one that freed the Devourer. We then return to the battle down below, with the mechanic taunting Nia about not being a real ninja. Nia then regains her powers and knocks down the mechanic, who attempts to fire at her, but she is saved by Okino. Cole and Vangelis are the next to fight, with Vangelis pinning down Cole and going to strike him, only to be stopped by Adam and the rest of the Upli. Cole takes back his sights and breaks away the crystal, trapping Vangelis in a hole in the ground before it shows Kai fighting Asphira. As Kai goes to attack Asphira, Pythor suddenly appears before being knocked down by Jay, who shortly defeats him, reclaiming his nunchucks as Kai does the same with a sword of fire. With the golden weapons now reclaimed, the crystal army begins to lose power, and all the characters begin to easily destroy the crystal warriors. They all celebrate their victory, but as Sphira appears and tells them that in moments they'll all be corrupted, with Zane thankfully freezing her before she can say revenge for the 20 millionth time. The overlord tells Lloyd, Garmin and Harumi that they failed and shoots his powers into the main crystal on the island, causing the island to build up a large beam. The episode ends with it seeming like the ninja are too late to stop it. I'll be giving this episode a 9 out of 10. We're finally here at the final episode of the season, being episode 30, Roots. The episode starts with the battle against the overlord continuing. The Overlord sends Garmanon crashing to the ground, and Lloyd rushes to his father, with Garmanon returning to his more human form as he tells Lloyd he's sorry and it's too late for him, before appearing to die. The Overlord tells Lloyd not to mourn, as he'll be joining Garmanon soon, which is enough to finally push Lloyd over the edge and embrace his Oni side, transforming into his four-armed golden Oni form in a monstrous scene. Lloyd uses his new form to attack the Overlord, who actually looks scared, which doesn't last more than 5 seconds, as just one glimpse of himself in the crystal causes Lloyd to see himself as his greatest fear and revert back to normal, being blasted off the island but grabbing back on at the last second. He cuts to the down below with the ninja, where Wu comes up the idea of uniting the golden weapons, destroying the weapons and unleashing the elemental energy connected with them, transforming to whatever form they originally had. The ninja flies to the Weher's rooftop, with Zane thanking the others for being the best friends you could have asked for. The ninja raised their weapons to the end before uniting the weapons together, causing a large beam of golden light to counteract the overlord's power. This scene actually made me tear up the first time I watched it, just thinking that this could possibly be the final time we see the original four ninja. We get a shot of the ninja turned to crystal before the elemental energy from the golden weapons shoot upwards and hit a falling lord, giving him the four-headed golden ultra dragon. An epic battle between the golden ultra dragon and the overlord ensues, of course being reminiscent of the first final battle with Lloyd once again commanding a golden dragon against the Overlord. Lloyd combines all the dragon's powers and manages to turn the Overlord's center form into a statue, using the tail of the dragon to smash to pieces, freeing Ninjago of the crystals. It is then revealed that Garmanon didn't die, and is only faking so Lloyd is used his only form. Wow, what a shocker, Ninjago refuses to kill a main character once again. The crystal island explodes and everyone celebrates, with Lloyd, Garmanon and even Harumi flying down to join the others with Lloyd defending Hermi as she is now miraculously redeemed. The ninjas share a moment with the golden dragon before it disappears, Wu telling them that the elemental powers are returning from where they came from. Ending the scene with the ninja reverted back to how they were at the beginning of the show, without any elemental powers, returning to their roots. Ah, uh, ah, uh, see what I did there? I should really go outside more, shouldn't I? It then cuts to Garmanon planting Christopher on a mountain, coming to the realization that having roots and sticking together is not a sign of weakness. Garmanon walks away from Christopher and the episode reveals the ninja repairing the monastery. There suddenly appears and reveals that everyone has come to help repair the monastery together, all the while inner steel is heard in the background. Wu watches as everyone works together to repair the monastery and a slowed in Garmanon's bond is repaired as well. Ending the episode and the season with Wu commenting on how remarkable it is to see so many people from different backgrounds work together as the camera moves away from the monastery and back to Christopher's mountain, featuring the same colour palette as the opening scene from the pilots ending it the way it all began. I'll rate the final episode a score of 7 out of 10. Honestly, after rewatching part 2, it isn't as bad as I remember, probably because I wasn't watching it in Chinese or a 360p YouTube video of a child recording his TV screen while his parents file for divorce in the background. Since the first episode of part 2 was all about Rumi, let's start talking about her first. I said before that I wasn't a fan of them bringing back Rumi, and after the end of the season, I'm still not a fan of them bringing back Rumi. Throughout the season, there's this weird tension between Lloyd and Rumi as if the writers want us to root for these two to get together, and it just does not work. Harumi's redemption at the end doesn't bother me as much as I thought it would, but it still feels pretty undeserved. All she really did was change sides at the last second, and suddenly all of her crimes have been forgiven. Another pretty strange character this season would have to be Garmanon, or more specifically his relationship with Lloyd. It feels like something right from the Ninjago movie, with all the banter and arguing. Sure, it was like that in season 10, but I didn't even like it back then, so seeing them continue to use that dynamic just didn't fit for me. I suppose Garmanon being more silly and comedic could be a sign of him becoming more human and less Oni. I did really like the Christopher and plotline though, 
It served as a great allegory for the relationship between Cameron and Lloyd, even if it had its issues. A common complaint I've seen in Part 2 is that the Crystal Council were underused, and that is absolutely true. Part 1 really spent a lot of time building them up, with the first half of Part 2 showing how much of a threat they are, and then they all just disappear. I guess because these are already established villains that have had their own seasons to shine, the writers didn't want to give them that much screen time, so they could focus all the attention on the newer elements, which as a shame, as the council were so great together, both in the way they interacted with each other, and how they were a real challenge for the ninja. Remember that awesome one-on-one -on -one fight between Wu and the Overlord? Wu absolutely should have died during that. It's time that old bastard finally dies. Wu's death could have served to push the ninja down even further, making them lose total hope that they stand a chance against the Overlord, which would make their eventual rise and victory more impactful now that they were doing it to honor Wu, making sure his death wasn't in vain. I also wouldn't be opposed to Garmin on dying this season too, but I think Wu was the one who needed to die, whereas Garmin's death would just be the cherry on the cake. It would certainly leave a bigger impact if both sons of the first Ninja and Master died this season. Lloyd would have been the one to then bury Christopher in, in memory of both Wu and Garmin. Speaking of the Overlord, it is a huge missed opportunity that the original four ninja never got to fight him this season. It would have been incredible to see the four of them face off against the Overlord's physical form for once. I mean, they absolutely would have lost, but still, it could have been an incredible battle to show how far the ninja have come, being able to hold their own against the Overlord. Okay, this next thing is very much a nitpick, but how come all the ninja get new golden outfits, but Skylar keeps her hunted suit throughout the entire season? It's not like there wasn't a design for a new suit, as they literally had one in the sets. <laughs> You must be a real idiot if you bought that set for that figure, only for it to not be featured in the show. Damn it! Now let's focus on just the final episode, starting with how pointless Lloyd's only form was. All of that build up from to just throw it away. It does make sense in the way that he's becoming like his father, which is his greatest fear, but after seeing how his father has changed throughout the season, Lloyd shouldn't still be as scared of embracing his only side. Him rejecting the only form does kind of work however as it does line up with how he acts to Mastake, offering the mask of hatred in the episode The Weakest Link of Season 9, refusing to use dark magic to win. But Lloyd also should have learned from Mastake in Season 9 that not every Oni is evil, and embracing the power of an Oni doesn't exactly make you evil. Lloyd's Oni form being golden kinda reflects this, showing that even if he's using Oni power, he's still in control, with the goal showing that the light will always prevail through whatever dark power is being used. Then we have the ending to the season, which, just like Wu said, is pretty remarkable, or at least it could be. Don't get me wrong, I do really love the ending scene, with all of these characters you've grown to love over Ninjago's many years, being together in this one scene with them all working together is truly a sight to behold, but it's just the music that doesn't work for me. Inner Steel does absolutely fit this scene, with that song being all about finding strength within and coming together, but for this to be the end to the current Ninjago story as we know, it doesn't really feel like it should be here. A more appropriate song would have to be the classic Ninjago Overture, or even the Weekend Whip, as both of those songs have been with Ninjago since the beginning. If you just forget about this supposedly being the end of the current Ninjago story, then this scene is absolutely great, with the music being the perfect choice. I'll be giving part 2 a score of 5 out of 10. Well, there we have it. Ninjago Crystallized has finally come to an end, and what a ride it has been with the terrible release schedule. I absolutely despise the way this series came out. Just dropping all the episodes in two parts on Netflix is literally the worst way they could have done it. Either that or sell it all on a USB drive on eBay. I've seen a lot of shows do this whole different parts release, and it has not worked once. It's just a terrible idea, creating all of this hype for the show to be over in one day. It really ruins the fun and excitement of speculating each week on what's gonna happen next. I mean hey, at least we got it all, right? I was convinced that part 2 is gonna end up as lost media. Crystallized, terrible release doesn't impact my rating of the season, because you have to detach the way something was released and just focus on the product itself. And so with that, I'll be giving Ninjago Crystallized a final score of 6 out of 10. This season definitely has its flaws, but to me, they are massively outweighed by the positives. So is Ninjago Crystallized overhated or overrated? To me, this season is overhated. But of course, everyone has an opinion, so why not drop yours down in the comments below. And feel free to rip each other limb from limb over a Lego show about ninjas.